Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to get into planar graphs. So let's start with a, an example. I've got two graphs drawn here. Just take a quick inspection to see that they are actually the same graph. They are both graphs which we'll call G. All it is is they are two different drawings of the same graph. How can we check to see if they are the same graph? Well, you can notice that there is a cycle on the vertices 1 through 5 here, and there is also a cycle on the vertices 1 through 5 around the outside. We have another cycle on the vertices 16 through 20. We have that same cycle on the vertices 16 through 20 here. And then you can just follow through that all the connections on one graph are the exact same connections on the other graph. So these are the same graph. What's the difference then? Well, the difference in, is in how we drew them. The one on the right has a particularly nice drawing in that the only places that edges intersect is at their vertices. Whereas the one on the left, we can see that we get edges crossing each other, but it's not at a vertex. So the drawing on the right is what we call a planar embedding of the graph G. So I'll put that in parentheses here. This is a planar embedding. And so if the question is, can we draw this graph G on the plane such that no edges intersect except at the vertices that they are incident with? Then the answer is yes, and there's the drawing on the right. This gives rise to our main definition for this lecture, and that is this definition of being planar. So a graph G is called planar if it has a drawing in the plane or on a piece of paper so that edges intersect only at the vertices. That's what it means to be a planar graph. You can find a drawing of it for which the edges only intersect at vertices. Such a drawing is called a planar embedding. There could be more than one way to draw the graph so that it's a planar embedding. So in other words, a graph G could exhibit more than one planar embedding. So let's have a look at some examples. So here is a graph. It's got four vertices and I'll throw one more edge in here. So it's got five edges. This is a planar graph. because I've drawn it with a planar embedding. How about another one? Maybe something like this. We've got a triangle and then a couple more edges hanging off of it. This is a planar graph because I've been able to draw a planar embedding of it. Here's a question. Is K4 planar? So the complete graph on four vertices. Well, let's get a picture for it. So our K4 looks like this, where every vertex is connected to every other vertex by an edge. We typically would draw it in such a way as this. So there is a crossing of two edges, namely the two diagonal edges, where they are intersecting, but it's not at a vertex. It's at this point right here. These edges intersect, but that's not a vertex. So is K4 planar? Well, we'd have to try to find a planar embedding. And so the answer is yes, it is planar, but we can't see it from the drawing that we have on the left. We need to draw a planar embedding to convince ourselves. So we need to draw a planar embedding. So what could a planar embedding look like? Well, we just have to draw the graph so that the edges don't intersect except at a vertex. So we've got that graph from the top left corner that we knew was planar. Now I still need to connect the vertex in the top left with the vertex in the bottom right. And I can do that by just letting that edge go around the other side. And so there's a planar embedding. So this is a planar embedding. of K4. So yes, it is planar, and that's the reason why. We can draw it so that it's a planar embedding. Is the cubic graph planar? So I'll put cubic in quotations. 
because I haven't defined what it is, but it'll be somewhat obvious when I draw out what it is, is the cubic graph planar. Well, the cubic graph is basically just, maybe I'll keep the vertices as blue as I've been doing all along. It's basically a drawing of a cube. So we'll draw your front face of our cube, and then we will draw the rest of the cube. So it looks like this. Oops, I'll keep those in white as well, white edges. So there's our cubic graph. We can see we've got some crossings of edges that don't happen at vertices. And so in order to figure out if this is a planar graph, we have to come up with a redrawing of it. And so the answer is, yes, it is. But we need to draw a planar embedding. So this is the key. If we want to show something's planar, we're going to have to draw it in such a way that it is a planar embedding. So how are we going to do it with this one? Well, I'm just going to focus on a couple of cycles. I'll focus on this cycle right here. So let's draw that one first. So there's that, I like to think of it as a front face of the cube, that's what I'm thinking about it as. And then we've got this other cycle consisting of these other four vertices. So I'm going to draw those other four vertices out like this. And there's our four cycle. And then the remaining edges that connected that front face to the back face, those are these edges here. And so there's a planar embedding. So the graph is planar because we've managed to draw a planar embedding of it. Now in order to figure out if a graph is planar or not, it, re it requires us, if we think it's planar, to redraw it. So this requires us to be able to you know, think about these graphs in a dynamic way to imagine the vertices moving around, the edges coming along with them. And for this, it's helpful to have an active imagination. So if, in order to get across this idea of an active imagination, I'm just going to use um, a, a tool that allows me to drag the vertices around. But this is the kind of picture you want to have in your head. So here's our cubic graph. I want to know if I can get a planar embedding. I just imagine dragging the vertices around. This is all the same graph as the one I started with. These are all cubic graphs. I'm not changing any of the connections. Two vertices are still connected even after I move the vertices. So these are all the same graph. I just need to try to redraw it in such a way that I lose all of the intersections except at vertices. And I can see, oh, I've got it. I've managed to redrag everything around and now I've got that here's a planar embedding. It's not the one I had in the notes that we drew, but we could you know, keep going with this and maybe keep dragging these around and make an outer, an outer square and an inner square, or at least this, in this case it's a rectangle, at least because I'm not so much worried about the lengths, but there we go. There's essentially the picture we had in our notes and there's our planar embedding of our cube. So we've got some examples here of planar graphs, uh, some that required us to redraw them in order to see they were planar. How about examples of non-planar graphs? Well, the two basic examples of non-planar graphs are K33 and K5. We're not going to be able to give a formal proof that these are not planar in this lecture. We will in the next lecture. So for right now, we're going to assume that these are facts. And we're going to build the rest of this lecture off of these facts. However, rather than just state them as facts and move on, we can try to convince ourselves that K33 is not planar by doing that same kind of exercises, just imagining dragging these vertices around or trying to redraw the edges in such a way that we get a planar embedding. So let's see what happens in that case. We're going to start with our K33. And we'll add our edges in. 
So there's our K33. And what we would like to do is we would like to see if we can get a planar embedding. So we will try to draw a planar embedding. This requires, as I said, a bit of an active imagination. Imagine moving these points around. So we can use a pencil and paper and just sort of push vertices around and let the edges come along with it. I'll just use some dynamic uh, software that will allow the edges to go along with it. So what I'm imagining in my head is, okay, I'm going to move a vertex to try to eliminate some crossings. Maybe I'll keep going. I'll just bring it over to this side. That eliminated a bunch of crossings. This vertex, there's still two edges off it that are crossing. And so, okay, good, I can move that one in. And just that alone, I've managed to redraw the graph so there's only one crossing. Can I get rid of that one crossing now? Well, it involves one of the edges connecting to this vertex. So if I push it in there, it's like, oh no, now I've introduced another crossing. So I, at the cost of one crossing, I've introduced another one. And it turns out that we just can't eliminate this one crossing. We've got it down to one crossing, but I can't eliminate it. So I can't get a planar embedding of this. It's not clear just from playing around with this that this is really the case. Uh, and that's why we've reserved the formal proof to next lecture, but we're just trying to get a feel. Why is it not planar? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to redraw the graph in such a way just to get a feel for why it perhaps isn't planar. So this is analogous to that idea of dragging these vertices around, but instead I'm going to focus on some aspects of the original graph. So what I'm going to do is I'll just number these so we can keep track. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's our vertices. One, two, three, four, five, six. I notice there's a cycle, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 back to 1. So that's this cycle here. And in order to get this redrawing of the graph, I have to include all the other edges. So let's make sure we get those other three edges that I'm missing. So I'm missing the edge 6 to 3, so we'll add that one in. I'm also missing the edge 2 to 5, so we'll add that one in. I can't go across the diagonal of this hexagon, so what I'll do is I'll go around the outside. And there we go, we've got the edge in there. So far I've avoided all crossings. I still have one edge left to put in. And if I can put this one in and avoid all crossings, then I've got my planar embedding. The issue is that last edge has got to connect 1 and 4. And the problem is, if we look at what's going on with vertex 1, vertex 1 is inside, interior to this cycle, whereas vertex 4 is outside. So if I'm going to draw the edge from 1 to 4, I have to cross that yellow cycle somewhere. And I can't do it then. I can't get a planar embedding. I'll just draw a couple of examples here. Oh, if I drew it there, I'd get a crossing. That's a problem. If I drew it around the outside, I get a crossing. And so we are at the point where we cannot fit in this final edge. Cannot fit this edge 1, 4 into the diagram without crossing another edge. So it looks like there's just one too many edges for it to be planar. Now of course this isn't a proof because I started with pretty much most of the drawing already and I just basically illustrated here that I can't complete it. Maybe if I started the drawing in a different way there is a way to complete it. So that's why just drawing a graph and showing hey I can't fit the last edge in here is not a proof because maybe we could start the drawing in some other way right from start and get a planar embedding. So in order to prove something's not planar, we need to give a formal proof of that, which we're delaying until next lecture. So how about K5? Let's get a feel for why K5 
shouldn't be planar. So we'll draw K5 out. And you can do this. You can pause the video and, and try this out on your own. Just draw K5 out. And then see if you can move the vertices around and try to get a planar embedding. So there's K5. We will try to draw a planar embedding. So in order to do that, again, we'll number the vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we will start with that cycle as it's drawn. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We'll start with that outer collection of edges. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We've got five more edges to fill in. So be, before we fill those in, Let's go ahead and try to imagine moving these vertices around in our head. So I'm just going to start to drag these around. Oh, oh, actually, not too bad. If you notice what we got so far, maybe I'll drag them out. Sometimes I like to just go to the extreme and get these vertices far away from each other. And we've got one crossing. So we're able to get it down to a picture where there's one crossing. Can we avoid a crossing at all? Well, if I try to move things around, no, I seem to introduce a new crossing. So it looks like I've got, again, one too many edges to make it planar. And so let's get a feel for that in terms of the drawing. So I'm going to fill in some edges here. We'll draw in 5, 2, and 5, 3. And then we'll go for uh, 4, 2. Maybe I'll put these in a different color. Now we'll go for 4, 2. And I've got to make sure that I don't cross any of the existing edges. So there's 4, 2. And then I have two edges coming out of 1. One goes to 4 and one goes to 3. So I can draw an edge going from 1 to 4. That's this one here. And then I've got that final edge from 1 to 3 that I've got to draw in. We kind of landed in the same problem that we had in the last case, and that is we've got a cycle here that three, the vertex three is inside and vertex one is outside. So I've got vertex one out here, vertex three here. There's no way to connect them up without crossing that yellow cycle. And so at least in terms of how I started this diagram off, there's no way to fit that last edge in. So we run into a problem. So there's a crossing that happens there, or if I drew it this way, there's a crossing. And so as much as before, we cannot fit edge, in this case, 1, 3, into the drawing without crossing uh, an existing edge. And so that's just to get a feel for why these two graphs, K33 and K5, are not planar. Again, we haven't proved it. We just tried to build up the intuition as to why they aren't planar. There's just one extra edge and that's why they're not planar. And that's actually what we're going to do in the next lecture for our FOMO proof. We will come up with a property that, or properties that planar graphs must have and we will show that these two graphs don't have those properties and therefore they're not planar. That's going to be our formal proof. All right, so now where are we going to go from this point in this lecture? So we've introduced planar graphs. We've looked at some examples of planar graphs, and now we've got these two fundamental examples of non-planar graphs. At this point, we want to develop a criteria which allows us to detect whether a graph is planar or not. And that requires a knowledge of these two graphs, K33 and K5. Specifically, we are going to get to the criteria that says, if one of these graphs lives inside our graph, then our graph can't be planar. So the reason our graph isn't planar would be because there's a K33 or a K5 sitting inside it. Now we have to be specific as to what we mean by sitting inside it. So this would mean that either K33 or K5 is a subgraph, or there's something that's inside that looks like a K33 or K5. We need to be a bit more specific about what we mean by looks like. 
And that's this notion of a subdivision. So just very briefly, without reading any of the definition, I'm just going to show you what a subdivision is. If we've got an edge in our graph that goes from vertex u to vertex v, and we call that edge e, then to subdivide the edge means basically to just slap a vertex right in the middle of that edge. So u, v, we're going to slap a vertex w right in the middle of that edge and thereby split or subdivide this edge into two new edges, E1 and E2. To be a little bit more formal about this, that's what this definition states. It says we've got an edge. To subdivide the edge means we delete the edge entirely, add a new vertex, and then add two new edges. So it would mean we got rid of this edge altogether, stuck a vertex in, and then added the two edges. So that's the more formal way of subdividing. Although in practice, you can think about it as just dropping a vertex in the middle of an edge and splitting it in half. If a graph H is obtained from G by a sequence of subdivisions, then we call H a subdivision of G. So let's have a look at an example. Maybe we've got a graph with four vertices, maybe something like this. If this is vertex u and vertex v, and this is edge e, then we can subdivide e. And what would that look like? Well, we've effectively removed edge e from our graph. We've put in a new vertex, which we call W, and then we've connected it up with two new edges, E1 and E2. So that's the subdivision of edge E. We could do a bunch of those. So we could do a sequence of subdivisions. And if we do a sequence of subdivisions, we could get a graph that looks like this. So we've got our original graph. We've got that new vertex we added. And then we can do a whole bunch more. We could subdivide, say, that edge that goes from the top vertex to the bottom one. But then we could subdivide it again and again. We could also subdivide that other edge that we have already subdivided once. We could subdivide this one a couple of times. We could subdivide the other one, you know, one of the other outer edges, and we could keep going. And so as long as we keep adding vertices, removing edges, adding a vertices, and replacing the, the edge with two new edges connecting to that vertex, then that's a subdivision. And so we've got a full sequence of subdivisions that produces a new graph. The key observation here is that if my original graph has a planar drawing, then my subdivision has a planar drawing, and vice versa. If my subdivision is a planar graph, then my original graph is planar. And so that's the observation down here. If H is a subdivision of G, H is planar if and only if G is planar. So what that means is that every subdivision of K33 and K5 are non-planar. So instead of trying to find K33 or K5 inside a graph to show that the graph is not planar, we can just look for a subdivision of K33 or K5, and that will be sufficient. So let's have a look at how to do this. So we want to know, is this graph planar? If it is, we need to draw planar embedding. So if we think the graph is planar, we need to draw a planar embedding. Otherwise, if we want to show that it's not planar, we try to find a subgraph isomorphic to a subdivision 
of K33 or K5. So that's just a fancy way of saying, if I want to show it's not planar, try to find something that looks like K33 or K5 sitting inside it. Because if K33 or K5 sits inside it, or even a subdivision of those sit inside it, then it can't be planar because those graphs themselves aren't planar. So let's try to find a subdivision of K5 inside this graph. So we'll go ahead and draw the graph out again. And what I'm interested in doing is just trying to find something that looks like K5 inside it. That's because I'm deciding that just for this part here, I'm looking for a K5 inside it. We'll do a second part where we try to find K33 inside it as well. So I'm looking to find K5 inside this thing. So the way I like to do it is I just like to highlight the, the vertices. So if I'm going to find K5 inside it, I have to pick five vertices, which are going to be the five vertices of K5. So I will pick this one, this one, we'll pick this one, this one, and this one. And we'll number them. One, two, three, four, five. So I see already that one connects to two, and three, and four, and five. So that's perfect. So I'm getting this subgraph. So I'll just identify what parts I've got already. One, two, three, four, five. And one's connecting to all of those. So we've got that part of the subgraph already. What about two? I've got two connects to three and four. So two connects to three and four. Three connects to, well, the new one is three connects to four. Got that edge. And what else? Four connects to, I've already got it connecting to three of the vertices. It's got to connect to five. So I need to get the edge four, five in. The problem is four doesn't connect directly to five in my graph. What it does do, however, is it connects through another vertex. And so what that means is I can get an edge from, well, I, maybe I should say I can get a path from 5 to 4. It's just that it has a vertex sitting on it. So it's a subdivision. So this graph is a subdivision of, well, it'll eventually be a subdivision of K5, but I don't have the rest of the edges drawn in here. So let's get all of those ones in here, and then we'll make that statement. So how about 5 to 2? Does 5 connect to 2? Well, there's a way to get from 5 to 2 in our graph. It just involves going through another vertex. In this case, we're going through this vertex here. So I can go from 5 to 2. I don't have an edge connecting them, but I do have a subdivided edge connecting them. And then lastly, I need to go from 5 to 3. That's my last edge. And I can do that. I can go from 5 to 3. It's just it's got a vertex in the middle of it. So I can go from 5 to 3 with a vertex added or subdividing that edge. And there we go. What we have done is we found that inside our graph, inside this graph, we've identified a subgraph. Notice I didn't use a few of the edges. Anything that's still white, I didn't use those. So we've identified a subgraph that is something that looks like K5. In particular, it's a subdivision of K5. This is not planar, so my original graph can't be planar. So this is a, this is not planar. So original graph is not planar. And again, the logic there is we found a subgraph that isn't planar, so the original graph can't be planar. If I want to draw these last few edges in, um, just to see, we've got a redrawing of the graph here. But notice that red and yellow connect. So there is an edge that connects these ones. There's an edge that connects uh, red and green. And there's an edge that connects 
green, and yellow. So those are the final three edges, which makes this now a redrawing of the original graph. And it's been drawn in such a way that we can see it looks like a K5 or a subdivision of K5 sitting inside our original graph. We can do the same thing for K33. So just finding a subdivision of K5 is enough. The graph's not planar. But just by way of contrast, we can go ahead and see how we could find a K33 inside this one. Again, I'll use the white for the original graph. And then we want to identify six vertices which are going to form the backbone of our K33. So what are those six vertices? We'll color code them. I'll pick this one for our subgraph. So we're going to go three vertices and then we'll do three other vertices to get our K33. Call that vertex one. What are the red vertices? Well, it'd be nice to pick the vertices that are neighbors of this blue vertex, which we've labeled one. So that one's a neighbor of it, this one's a neighbor of it, and that one's a neighbor of it. So we'll call this, you know, maybe the blue ones will go one, two, three. So this would be four, five, and six. So maybe that's four, five, and six. And this is vertex one. And then we need two more blue vertices. We'll pick this one since it's already connected to two of the red ones and we'll pick this one since it's already connected to two of the red ones. So that would be vertex two and vertex three. So we're trying to build a subgraph that looks like K33. We've got one connects to six, five, and four. So we've got these edges. We have that four connects directly to two and six connects directly to three. So four connects to two and six connects to three. What else do we have? Do we have two connecting to five? Yeah, we have two connecting to five. Do we have two connecting to six? Well, two does connect to six, but it passes through a vertex. So that means we can connect two to six, it's just we have to use a subdivision. And what's last? Well, we need three to five and three to four. Does three connect to five? Oh yeah, that's a direct connection. So three does connect to five. Does three connect to four? It does, it just does so through this other vertex. And so we can connect three over to four but it's going to be a subdivision. And so there we go. We found a subgraph of our graph, which is a subdivision of K33. This is not planar. And so original graph is not planar. And so this gives us a method for showing a graph is not planar. If we can find either a K5 or a K33 subdivision inside it, then the graph isn't planar. In fact, it turns out that K5 and K33 are precisely the obstacles for planarity. A graph is not planar if and only if one of these graphs is lurking inside it. And that's this Kuratowski-Wagner theorem. So just a brief definition. We've been using this terminology already, but uh, we'll formalize it. So if G and H are multigraphs, we say that G contains a subdivision of H if there is a subgraph of G isomorphic to some subdivision of H. And so what we're really interested in is we are interested in those graphs that contain subdivisions of K5 or K33. So that's our way of saying K5 or K33 are lurking inside the graph. Kurotowski-Wagner says that that's the only reason a graph would not be planar. So a graph, a multigraph, is planar if and only if it does not contain 
subdivisions of either K33 or K5 inside it. So a couple of notes we can make from this. So the first note is that if G is planar, then so is any subgraph and subdivision of G. And the way we are using this is if there is a subdivision or a subgraph that is not planar, then the original graph can't be planar. So we're using the contrapositive of this. And two, there is a linear running time algorithm which can detect planarity. This is the Hopcroft Tarjan planarity test, which was discovered around 1974, and it runs linear in the size of the vertex set plus the size of the edge set. So it's a linear running time algorithm for detecting planarity. So the Kuratowski-Wagner theorem is a celebrated result that tells us exactly when a graph is going to be planar. It's planar if it doesn't have a K33 or K5 sitting inside it, or a subdivision of those sitting inside it. So now we're going to focus our attention on planar graphs and what their properties are. So from this point forward in this lecture, we're assuming all the graphs we encounter are planar, and so now we can start defining things for those graphs. So if we've got a planar graph, then the embedding partitions the plane into connected regions called faces. There is one unbounded region called the infinite face, and there are other faces, or all other faces I should say, are called the internal faces. If G is connected, every face has vertices and edges on its boundary, and they form a closed walk called the facial walk. So let's have a look at these terms in relation to a specific example. So we'll look at an example that looks like this. So we've got our triangle, maybe we've got a couple of parallel edges, maybe we've got a loop up here. So there's our graph G. We'll label these things as well. We'll call that vertex 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. I'll also label the edges. We'll call this loop A and maybe B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. What are the faces? Well, we've got a planar embedding. It splits up our piece of paper or the plane into a bunch of regions. Here are the regions. There's this one that's trapped inside the loop. There's this one that's trapped inside this triangle. There's another face, which we call F3, which is here. We've got one inside these parallel edges. That's F4. And then we've got the infinite one. Everything outside is F5. So we've got five faces, F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. These ones are called the internal faces, or the finite faces, and this is the infinite face. And then to talk about a facial walk is really the following. We pick a face, let's say face three. Then what we do is we pick a vertex on it and just wander around the outside of the face recording the vertices and the edges that we hit. And so there is a walk around face three, and it consists of four vertices and four edges. Here's a walk around face two, which is of length three, consists of three edges, and so on. So we'll just record some of these. So we'll look at some facial walks. So for example, we'll do the couple that we just talked about. The F2 walk, we can start at vertex 1, and we just walk around the face like that. And so it's 1 along edge C to vertex 2, along edge D to vertex 3, along edge B back to vertex 1. 
and this has length 3. The length is just the number of edges, and we traveled along edges C, D, and B, so that's length 3. How about another one? Maybe F1. What's our facial walk around F1? Well, we start at vertex 1, we go around the loop, back to vertex 1. So it's a nice short one. Maybe we'll put this in a purple color here, just as an arrow. So we start at 1, we go along A, back to 1, and so that's of length 1. Maybe we'll do an F4 one as well. So F4 is going to look like this. Maybe we'll start at vertex 2, and we'll just wrap around and come back to vertex 2. So it goes 2 along edge F to 4, along edge E back to 2, and so that has length 2. And of course the one you probably been waiting for, the big one, the infinite face. Let's see what that walk is. So if we go around the whole outside, we just start at any vertex that's touching that face. I can start at 1 in that case. And then we just wander around the outside. until we get back to where we started. And so what it is, it's, we'll put this one in green, I guess. So we start at one, we went along C to two, along F to four, along G to five, then along H to six, come back along H to five, then along I to three, then along B to one, there's still an edge that's touching F5 that we haven't gone along yet, and that's the loop A back to 1 again. And this has length. Well, now we can either count the edges in here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or we can count them by looking at the diagram. Probably best idea is to do both to make sure we get the same answer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's of length 8. And so there's some examples of faces and facial walks. You might say, why are we interested in these things? Well, one of the nice things about planar graphs is there are some deep connections between the faces, the edges, the vertices, vertex degrees. All of these things start to come together. That's what we're going to explore over the rest of this lecture and then also the next lecture as well. But the first thing I just want to draw our attention to is the following. We could have drawn this planar embedding of this graph in a different way. So let's just look at this. What happens if we draw graph as and we just, I'll just change it a little bit. We'll have our triangle up top still. We'll still have that sort of square here. We'll still have that parallel edge. The things I'm missing are my loop and that edge H that goes out to six. Instead, I will have my loop do this. And my edge connecting 6 do this. Now in this drawing we get different faces. For example our infinite face F5 the facial walk around it is just of length 1 because it just goes around the loop and back to 1 again. So if F5 is the infinite face then what's our facial walk? Our facial walk is start at 1, travel along A, and go back to 1. So now it has length 1. And so these things can change. So they are dependent on the drawing. So we'd really like to know, you know, what, what isn't dependent on the drawing? Well, how many faces are there? If we count them up, we'll still get five faces. We've got the inside the triangle, we've got this one in here, that's two, three, four, and then the infinite one is five. There's still five faces. Is that always going to be the case? And it turns out absolutely it's always going to be the case because the number of faces is related to the number of vertices and edges. And that's this celebrated theorem 
of Euler that says for any connected multigraph which we can embed in the plane, so it's a planar drawing, we have this relationship between the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the number of faces. This alternating sum has to be equal to 2. So what this means is that all embeddings of the planar graph have the same number of faces. So even though the drawings can look different, the number of faces has to be the same. So we will end this lecture with a proof of this result. We'll use induction on the number of edges. So we'll start with our base case. What's our base case in this case? Well, we want to do the number of edges, so we can start with our base case of no edges. So if the number of edges is 0, then we have that it's connected. Well, it has to have one vertex. So the number of vertices has to be 1, and then therefore the number of faces has to be 1. In other words, our graph has to look like this. One vertex, one face, I'll label that face as F1, and no edges. So there's our graph. Does that graph satisfy Euler's formula? And the answer is absolutely, because the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is, in this case, it's 1 minus 0 plus 1, or 2. And so it does satisfy Euler's formula. So we've got our base case. Now we can go for our induction hypothesis. And what that is, is we will assume the formula is true for all graphs. And I'm going to be succinct here, but they're all, all graphs satisfying the hypothesis, so connected planar graphs. But they're for all graphs with fewer than n edges for some fixed n greater than or equal to 1. So we're assuming that now this formula holds for all graphs with fewer than n edges. And so now we want to prove it's true for graphs with n edges. So now we're in our inductive step. Let's let g be a planar graph. Planar connected, I'll put the hypothesis in here now. Planar connected graph with n edges. We consider two cases. What are the cases? Well, the cases will be case one. Assume G has a cycle. So why are we assuming it has a cycle or not? Well, because what I want to do is I want to start with a graph on n edges, and I want to reduce it to a graph with one less edge, so I can use the induction hypothesis. So if I assume it has a cycle, then I can remove an edge from the cycle, and I still have a connected graph. And so I can use the induction hypothesis on that. I just need to know how I've changed the number of edges, the number of vertices, and the number of faces. So we're going to assume G has a cycle, and E is an edge on the cycle. Let F I and F J be the faces on either side of E. So we're thinking of a picture that looks like this. We've got a cycle and so on around. That's our cycle. We've got our edge E that's on that cycle. And we've got a face FI on one side of the edge and a face FJ on the other side of that edge. So what happens when we remove the edge? Remove E. So we get the graph G with the edge E removed. It has the following. How many vertices does it have? Well, it has exactly the same number of vertices as we started with. So there's the magnitude of V vertices. How many edges does it have? Well, I've removed an edge. So it's got the original number of edges minus 1. 
and how many faces does it have? Well, when I remove that edge E, now face I and face J merge together to form one face. So I've basically dropped the number of faces by one. And so this is our new count. V vertices, E minus one edges, F minus one faces. By the induction hypothesis, we have that Euler's formula holds for this graph, G take away E. So we know that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is equal to two. And so I know this equation is true. And then I can see that minus minus one, that's a plus one. And then a minus one here, those cancel off. And so this formula reduces down to V minus E plus F is equal to two. So the formula holds for G. So therefore, formula holds for our original graph G. So that's case one. If there's a cycle, we exploit it and remove an edge from it and reduce it down to a case where we can apply the induction hypothesis. What about case two? Well, this is assume G has no cycles. So G is a connected graph with no cycles. That's the definition of what it means to be a tree. So G is a tree. And now I'm going to state the result this way that I'm going to use about trees, but we've already proved it. And that is, since G is a tree, it must have a leaf. So there must be a vertex of degree one, i.e. what we call a leaf. Why is that? Well, we had a result from last lecture. Let's pop back to it. It was lemma 6.2.1, which said, if the degree of all vertices is bigger than or equal to two, then G must contain a cycle. Another way to say that is if G doesn't contain a cycle, then all the vertices cannot have degree bigger than two. So there must be a vertex of degree less than two. And because our graph's connected and we're in the case where there's one or more edges, uh, then there must be a vertex of degree exactly equal to one. So we're using this lemma to get that there is a leaf. So the picture we've got is that we've got our graph. I'll just draw it as a big blob there. Then we've got our edge E and it connects out to this leaf L. Now that means we've got this face, let's call it face sub I. And the same face is on both sides of edge E because of the fact that there's this leaf here. So we're sitting in this picture. So now what we do is we remove the leaf. So we're gonna remove L. So remove the leaf. So G take away the leaf. Basically what we're doing is we're getting rid of the leaf, but then we also have to get rid of the edge because there's no other vertex for it to connect to. So we basically got a situation where this is disappearing. And so what do we get? Well, we get that our new graph has, so maybe I'll say it as before, G take away L has, how many vertices? Well, I've removed a vertex. So there's one less vertice. I've also removed an edge. So there's one less edge. And the reason it's only one edge that I'm losing is because this was a vertex of degree one. It was a leaf, so I'm guaranteed I'm only losing one edge. How many faces do I have? Well, I have the same number of faces as I did before because the face on either side of E was the same face. And so we have all of those values. And so by the induction hypothesis, we have that the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is two. And much like we had before, this minus minus one, that becomes a plus one, and then it cancels with that minus one. And so we get back to V minus E plus F is equal to two. And so therefore, the formula holds 
for g. Those are the only two cases we could have. It either includes a cycle or it doesn't, so we're done with our inductive step. And so therefore, by induction, the formula holds for all graphs. And so we're done. So there we've proven a result that all planar graphs have to have. And that is that the number of vertices, the number of edges, and the number of faces are related to each other. So we'll scroll back up to the statement of the theorem again. And what this is telling us is that if I have a planar graph and I know any two of these three, I can get the third one. If I know how many faces there are and how many vertices there are, then I know exactly how many edges there are. All right, so that's it for this section. In the next lecture, we will get into some more properties of planar graphs. So we'll see you in the next lecture.